quiet, numbskulls. I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it. Stick it out of it. So, all right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. Back in the studio for another socially distanced approved edition of the business side of music. Another coronavirus COVID-19 episode coming your way here. In the studio today, long distance, I should say, we've had her on the show before as a guest, Katie Long, who's the owner and founder of DIY Music PR and the creator of the DIY Music PR Bootcamp. Katie, welcome back. Thanks so much, Bob. Excited to be here. I'm very excited about the guest you're about to introduce. I know. Well, actually, because you seem to know her and you've worked with her, and I've read her bio more than once, in fact, why don't you tell us a little bit about Cheryl here? Definitely. I would love to. So Cheryl B. Engelhart is one of my very good friends, but we actually met at the DIY Musician Conference. So a uh, little bit of a background on her. She's a New Yorker. Uh, she received a degree in biology, actually, uh, and in music from Cornell University, studied orchestration at Juilliard, and then is also a touring pop recording artist. So she's had a lot of successes in many realms, film composing, um, being an artist, all of the above, but she has also built a very uh, successful community for independent artists called In the Key of Success. So very excited to chat with Cheryl. Um, beyond that, she's become a very sought after a speaker on music business uh, panels and podcasts. She's spoken, spoken for thousands of people uh, about productivity, communication, online presence at South by Southwest, DIY Musician, and multiple other places. So you've probably heard of Cheryl at some point in your career as an indie artist, and we're excited to chat with her about how she has built a community for artists and also her recently released album, Luminary, which topped the charts in the New Age category on iTunes and Amazon. Cheryl Engelhart, welcome to the show. Thank you. I mean, it's no wonder, Bob, that you had to read that bio twice because, goodness, there's some stuff in there. But thank you, Katie, for the introduction. I appreciate there, it. I'm so glad to be here. There's a lot of big words. I like that. <laughs> Great. I always try to ask our guests this. How did you get started in the business? I got started when I was sitting at a concert. It was like a recital, really a piano recital. And my parents were sitting behind me and I was two. They were talking about how closely I was looking at and like listening to the music. And in the middle of them whispering to each other about how focused I was, I turned around and put my little finger over my face and was like, shh, right at them. And they are like, how does she know that that's like a thing that like you shouldn't talk during concerts? So I started playing the piano pretty soon after that. And I'd always been a ham and sang in college and high school and stuff. But it wasn't until after I graduated college, I thought I was going to be a marine biologist. And I had a job scuba diving for the government. And I got asked by a friend of a friend to um, come to Italy to write music for a website or little videos that were going to be on this website in Rome. And I was like, yeah, okay, that sounds way better than being underwater all day long in a wetsuit eight hours a day. So that kind of got everything started. I felt like a late bloomer compared to a lot of people that I knew at the time that I, I didn't get to like build my band in college. But I think that was a, a pretty good start. I learned that music can take me really cool places. And that led me to New York City and working in the advertising world. I just happened to stumble upon a messenger job that led to an ad agency that led to a jingle house where I was you know, lucky enough to become a composer there and was able to record my pop records and start touring and everything sort of one thing turned into another. And it was kind of it felt a lot of it felt accidental in the beginning. 
But isn't that kind of a nice way to say it, that it all accidentally fell into place? Because it's serendipity, I guess, of sorts, or it's 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 just, it's kind of natural. It's organic when it happens that way. It, yeah, it totally was until it wasn't. I think it really, I feel very lucky that I said yes to a lot of the right things. And then at some point I looked at my career and I was like, I don't want to be doing some of these things anymore. I was doing them because I had said yes at some point and I decided I had to start to be more intentional about what I wanted. Uh, I think that that was a really important shift that came for me probably about eight years into doing the indie DIY freelance composer m musician thing. But so yes, absolutely. And at some point I needed to make that make that shift for myself. You have five albums out, as Katie mentioned, the most one being Luminary, I believe is the correct title. Yep. That, and, and I listen to your music. You're you're kind of a renaissance person musically in that I don't think we can really fixate you on one style of music and luminary, especially because it's ambient new age with, you know, whatever that word is there. Yep. Was there any musical influences or let me say it this way. What were your musical influences getting started? What, who inspired you to travel down these paths? Cause it's really seems to be more than just one. I appreciate that. It totally, this fifth record is definitely an anomaly. Um, my first four were what I would consider piano, chick, pop, singer, songwriter stuff. And I think that those four are pretty tight in that category. My dad was a huge influence. He was a jazz guy, uh, could sit down on the piano, play anything, but didn't even know where middle C was. Like he was one of those musicians that like had it in him. And I was always so jealous. I, you know, I studied classical piano. So I think there's a lot of that in all of my music. When I was doing the pop stuff, I mean, I loved my man bands like Dave Matthews, Vertical Horizon, the Goo Goo Dolls, like all I'm of those, like not the boy bands. <laughs> I, I'm watching <laughs> Kate. I love the Goo Goo Dolls. They're my favorite. Yeah. So, I mean, Linkin Park, like the kind, the, like the emotion that you can get into the, the pop rock, but all, all of those. And then, you know, crossing over into the Alanis Morissette and Sheryl Crow. So that was like my world for like a decade. And I, I would listen to those records on repeat. I was, I'm one of those people that like, I get hooked on something and I can listen to a song 20 times in a row, like just being weird. So I think that that was a very direct influence into my pop stuff for sure. When it came to this new age record, I have to say, I look for music that what I, I mean, I wrote the record because I was really struggling for years with panic attacks and I was looking for music to sort of help the, the routines I was starting, which were a morning gratitude routine. I started to meditate a little bit, trying to find solutions because I really tr like literally tried everything to stop these like monthly panic attacks that would really take me out of the game. It kind of looked like food poisoning for me. It's like gross. And how to stop that anxiety. And a lot of the music I came across when I was looking for stuff either put me to sleep, like it was just so boring or it was very sweet and melodic. So it really took me out of like I wanted to the thing for me when I fix anxiety or like when I'm able to really tackle it is I get really present and those things kind of like took me out and like it didn't help at all so I wanted to create something that would help me keep myself present but also wasn't so melodic that my head starts to go like trying to sing along which I do very often so I wanted to create something and I and I think I did it with the piano and then there's some bells that I reversed and I plucked piano strings and reverse those sounds and then I do some humming and different things and I did a lot of like editing and, and post-production stuff myself part of the composition but the whole idea is to sort of go on a journey from like feeling a little anxious and not necessarily oh, I want to feel happier or calm so I'm going to go listen to happy and calm music it's like no I can't make that shift so fast so I could not find anything to really influence me for the luminary record it was it was kind of like a I'm going to create this and see if it lands for people and if not at least I created it for myself Katie shared something with me in fact I'll let her take direction of this you've had quite a bit of success with your projects lots of downloads lots of listeners I would love to hear a little bit about how you've promoted this album, because yes, you have had a ton of success with it as an indie album. And you've also done something really special, which is show your audience and your fans. And a lot of those fans are indie musicians, how to promote an album and make it successful, which this one obviously was. It was number one on Amazon and iTunes. So I would love to hear a little bit about what that process was. You have some influential partnerships with brands. Yeah, it's just kind of how you made that work for yourself. I created this record in August in a, an artist residency I got accepted to in Greece. And I didn't know what I was going to make when I got there. But then they showed me my room and it was this big stone room with a grand piano. And I was like, OK, cool. We're doing 
we're doing a piano record. Like there's, this is so gorgeous. So I came out of that and then I mixed it in October in a different residency. I was like, I think this is working. I think that like, I listen to this music when I drive and I don't want to honk as much. Like, I think, I think this is a good thing. And so I knew I wanted to really sit close ish to the new year as people are setting goals and trying to create something new for themselves. And so I was like, all right, it's November. Let's take three months and do a pre-order campaign. And I, I'm a big fan of playing games in my career. One of the games for a past record was to get it licensed 10 times. Um, so that, that record was all about licensing. And so I just sort of arbitrarily said, you know what? I would like to get this on the billboard charts for the new, for new age. Like let's play number one on the new age billboard charts. And I had done a bunch of research. I knew a couple people on it. I found out how many sales it took. And I was like, I can, I think I can do this. So I started talking to my fans and, and over email specifically and saying, this is what I want. And then I had to tell them like, what is billboard? Why does it matter? Why is it important to me? And then their question was, okay, cool. We're super clear. You're really excited about this goal for yourself. Like what can we do? And I had to get very clear on my answer. So each week I picked a different thing to focus on. So I would like one week, it would be all about pre-ordering it on iTunes. I would make little videos being like, I would screen share me logging into iTunes. This is where you go to click. I would make it like foolproof, dummy proof so that anyone that had never been on iTunes before could go figure out how to do this. I did that for Amazon. I did that for Bandcamp. I did it for all the places where, uh, that count towards the, the billboard charts. And so there was a level of education that had to happen. So me sort of saying what billboard was and why it matters in the music industry and how can help my fans know that my big game is to get a Grammy nomination. So like I would connect it to that. And I think that that level of education got them like, okay, cool. I'm clear. I'm, and I think they got to feel like they were part of an insider scoop. That's just music business and in, industry stuff. And that's sort of how I approached it to sort of play that game. And then each week focus on a different way that they could help um, different ways they could share. I had a whole like luminary champion checklist. There are 13 things on it. And if you did all the things, it was $21 and it would take you six minutes, including like sharing on Instagram, like all, all the different things that someone could do if they wanted to to help me hit that goal. Did you have any walls that you hit or were there any stumbling blocks or was it fairly fluid? Yes. Always stumbling blocks, always stumbling blocks for the indie musician. The big, the big one, the big one was that I got some infer insider information that uh, three weeks before my record was released, I would have been, I was number one on the, the charts for the sales where I was at in my pre-order campaign, except that the billboard charts changed how they count their sales. So three weeks before the campaign ended, I had been focusing on, on pre-orders because that it was a sales game. And then it became more of a streaming game. And so, and I had never focused on Spotify. It was just one of those things where as an indie artist, I have the things I can tackle and then the things that I just cannot get to right now. And so Spotify for me was one of those things I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to point everyone somewhere else and I'll figure out Spotify later. And it, it needed to be then. <laughs> it needed to have been figured out now. So, you know, what that did for the, the new age list is it took a bunch of people off the chart and put all of these old albums, like we're talking 2009, there's some old outdated albums on that chart just because they've been on playlists, like sleep playlists and things for a decade. And they're just, no one's taking them off the playlist. So they're getting all the streams and 1500 streams counts towards one album sale. So, you know, we're talking about millions of sales count or millions of streams that are counting for way more sales than I was at the time playing. So I did not get the billboard and I made a video with my dog and like announced to my fans, like when the charts came out and I like cried a little and I was like, we didn't hit the, the charts, but guess what? We're also in the top 25 best selling albums of all genres on Amazon and, and on iTunes, like sitting next to Kesha and like pop stars. So like there, just because I lost this particular game or just because I didn't, didn't win it doesn't mean I lost it. Like there were wins in other places. And that was a really, I think my fans appreciate and they stick around because they know I'm going to be super straight with them. We're going to take a break, get a word in for our sponsor. And when we come back, we're going to have some more conversation with Cheryl Engelhart here. Guest co-host Katie Long is with us today in these socially distanced safe zone here on the business side of music. This is Rick Caballo with Dead Horse Branding coming live from Nashville, Tennessee. And you're listening to the business side of music with this crazy guy, Bob Bender, hosting this show. You're listening to the business side of music. Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, the Singer Songwriter Rulebook, 101 Ways to Help You Improve Your Chances of Success. That's right. 
Everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena. And believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer-songwriter-performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer-songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics. All written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler and I approve of this message. Thanks. Hi, this is Tom Sabella, the creator, founder, and co-producer of the Business Side of Music podcast. It's loyal listeners such as yourself that make our podcast successful. Take the time to sign up for our weekly newsletter. Not only does it contain information on upcoming podcast episodes, but also informative tidbits on the music industry and even bonus items that we give away. All you have to do is sign up at businesssideofmusic.com and we will send you Larry Butler's new singer-songwriter rulebook. That's it. All you have to do is go to businesssideofmusic.com, sign up, and we will send you Larry Butler's new book. Thanks to all our loyal listeners. We love you. You're listening to the Business Side of Music. Long distance back in the studio here in Nashville, Tennessee. Katie Long is joining us from Mammoth Lakes, California, which, by the way, I have no sympathy for you whatsoever. You're you're in some of the most beautiful country in the world. And then our guest today, Cheryl Engelhart, who's about an hour and a half north of New York City. So we're geographically we're scattered all over the place you talk about i'm going to back up just a little bit first one of the things you said was you you would listen to an album or you would listen to a song like 20 times i don't find that strange whatsoever because and i want to ask you this question when you listen to a song because this is how my brain works when i listen to something and i love it and i'm still playing music that I first discovered in the 80s. Do you hear something almost every different time? Do you hear something added to it or something new? Or does it take you in a different direction? Or Because you're listening to it, obviously, over and over and over. So it's moving you somehow. That's a really great question. I think I'm like remembering the days of me being a messenger in New York City where I would have like my disc man. And so I would be out for like three hours and I would just listen to the same like 45 minute CD over and over and over again. And I think part of it was necessity. Part of it was just the emotional journey that it kept took me on started to become very familiar and I think that became like a safe space. So I think part of listening to songs over and over again is is because it like there might be some crazy stuff happening in life or circumstances but that became a constant for me. So it almost I would almost say no, but I do hear some pieces of music and I'm trying to think of something right off the top of my head and I'm not <laughs> getting anything where it absolutely I I have a couple of meditations I listen to and every single time I feel like there's this 45 minute one that I love and I can't remember her name, but she, Oh, Deborah Dewey. She's, and I, I swear to God, she changes it up for me every time I listen to this one MP3. Like I, I always hear something different in that. So I, I do, I do have that experience of like, they just, they must've just added that string line. That's never been there. I've heard this. I th- I really think that there must be some technology that allows you to do that. But <laughs> yeah, most of the time I think I, I, I'm actually listening it to it for familiarity's sake. When you created this latest album, Luminary, and correct me if I'm wrong, as a meditative piece, as as a body of work that can really maybe help clear your head, is it something you thought you were going to do before? Or you said that when you got to this this place and here was this piano and you were in the stone room and I think that's a picture of it on your website yep. if I remember correctly and it looks like this really cool place did it just all of a sudden click or had there been something feeding that for a while I th- yeah I think it's a little bit of both like I think there is definitely th- I think when I applied for the residency, I actually said I was going to create a choral album. I've been doing a lot of work with social justice choirs. So I was like, all right, I'll write some choral music there. And then when when I saw the piano in the room and, and heard it and played it, and I was like, this is like the bet, like it was this little abandoned mountain town. I never would have thought I would have turned a corner into this room. So there was absolutely something that clicked. that was like, cool. Nope, not doing vocal stuff. We're doing a piano thing. But I had for a couple years in the back of my mind thought to myself that it might be time to do something without lyrics and to do something that's more piano based and play 
back to like what I would consider my roots of music, but it was never something. I think one of my last records, I borrowed some mics for my, when I was recording the grand piano for my pop record, inevitably, which was all duets um, co-written with different people in, in the music industry. And I, I kept the mics an extra week so that I could just like improvise on my piano. And I recorded like eight different pieces. And I was like, this is going to be my piano record. And just like never, it was, so that's just sitting on my computer with just like a bunch of blah stuff. So I think, I think there was a seed of there should be some sort of non-lyrical album at some point, but it wasn't, it wasn't so deliberate until I got there and I was like, yep, okay, we're doing it now. It's happening. I have 14 days go. I know that at one point in my touring career and you wind up in a lot of rather large cities at New York, LA, Rome, you, know, you name it. And I remember we were playing this festival or this event way out in the country. I, I want to say probably at least two hours from, from Rome. And I kept thinking, who's going to go to this thing? Well, they put us in this villa in a small village that overlooked the ocean. And you got into that room and you, you stepped out on the balcony and you looked down and I don't know, the ocean was 50, 60 feet below us. And all of a sudden, this whole vibe kicked in of like all the stress from touring, all the stress from the shows, all the stress from the details of the business just kind of floated away. If you allow yourself that opportunity to let those moments take over, you can create some pretty darn good music. I mean, it's so true. I mean, that sounds magical. And that really, you really encapsulated what my experience was in Greece as well. It was like this new, brand new place. And it was the Wi Fi worked like 4% of the time. Like it was literally no distractions. There were goats everywhere. I had to like stop recording. I, I would do some high little, there's a lot of like morphed vocal things, but I would sit there and sing these, ah! And like, you'd hear all of the stray dogs in Greece barking outside. And I'm like, it's not that bad. And I'd have to wait like five minutes for them to stop barking. So I mean, like, there's some magic in in that record for sure because of the setting. And it's a really good lesson. I'm like, how can I replicate some of that here when it's time to get artistic and create like here, meaning like in New York, in my studio, you know, when I've got my husband and my dog and, you know, dishes to do all the things, how can I bring some of that element? Like, what are the things that are so special? Was it that I was traveling or was it that it was focused? So I think that's something really good to reflect on just as a creator. I'm enjoying so much hearing more about Luminary. I love your story and it was such a successful campaign for you. I'm so excited about this for you. Now, I do want to hear a little bit about In the Key of success because so Cheryl just for a little bit of background Cheryl and I met at the DIY musician conference which is CD Baby's conference that they put on it was in Austin last year and we were both speakers and indie artists from all over the country literally came to this conference to see Cheryl so <laughs> <laughs> which is saying something. And it's because of this community that she's built and it's called in the key of success. So um, beyond being a touring pop artist and composer and all of the above, Cheryl has created online um, boot camps and courses and all these other resources on the business side of music for independent artists. So I would love to shift gears a little bit if that's cool with you guys and go into that. I think it's worth saying like the very first time that we met Katie, it's like one of my favorite meeting stories was that the tech guys told me to go in and like check my computer and like hand my, my presentation. This is when the room was totally empty. It's like a, I don't know, a thousand person room. Yep. And Katie was speaking right before me. So she was there setting up her computer and we had never met before. And this room, this whole schedule was like the rest of the day was all dudes. I'm pretty sure. And we came up to each other and I like put, I was like, sorry to bother you. Put my computer there. She put her hands on her hips and she's like, we made it. It was the big stage. And so she's like superwoman stance. So we stood there together like, you know, Superman, a superwoman stance with your hands on your hips and just like chest held high. Never met this chick before in my life. And I was like, and now I'm in love. And that <laughs> that love that, is cool. <laughs> that love is <laughs> So it was just a really like amazing power moment of like just connectivity. And the I just felt the bond there and the love and the love in that whole conference is amazing anyway. So my, my shtick is really communication and like getting clear for yourself, what you want, and then communicating it with your fans. People are like, I mean, I've been asked this a lot. I've done a lot of podcasts about luminary, which I'm so grateful for. And most people are like, well, what was your strategy? And I was like, my strategy was to talk and 
talk about what I was up to. Like that was my strategy and it was well thought out, but I was very clear. I'm going to be number one on billboard unless they change the rules. And I'm and like, I just kept saying I'm, that is, that's the goal. And, and like, I'm going to get results because of the clarity around that goal. And I didn't get that result, but I got results. So, you know, I, it, I think that it's really important to be very good at communication, but the first step of that is clarity. So I do a little bit of personal development work. I am trained as a career coach because when I first started getting asked to speak at music conferences, I found myself answering a lot of musician questions with just, well, this is what I did. And I knew that there were like a hundred ways to do any one thing in this music industry. Like there are any, there's so many ways to get licensed. I got a ton of licenses because I had worked in the advertising industry and kept good contacts with friends that were editors, but like, that's not the only way to do it. So I was like, I need to really get good at listening for what's blocking in musicians and, and hearing that and then helping them get through those blocks. And so I got coaching or career coaching training. And then I was able to bring that into some actual communication tricks. Like I got very good at pitching. I did a whole bunch of experiments on my own tours as I pitched and learned how to create a perfect pitch so that I would get a response. A hundred percent of the emails I send, I get responses to whether it's a yes or a no. I think the biggest problem musicians have is actually getting a response. So pitching is part of that. And then email marketing is another thing I saw that was really working for me, but I knew I wasn't doing it totally right. And I saw so many other musicians doing it really, really wrong. And so I went outside into the digital marketing world and got certified as a digital marketing email specialist. And like when I go down rabbit holes, you guys, I'm a big fat dork. So, you know, I, I sort of took that, all that stuff that I learned for myself, like I, I was doing it for me, for my career. And then I was like, wait, no one's talking about this in the music industry. Like, all right, I guess I'm going to talk about it. And then I guess I'll put it in a PDF. Okay. I guess I'll make a court. Okay. We've got a course. Now we've got a course. Okay. Now we have an Academy in the key Academy. So now I'm gathering all the other great programs that I've done, or, uh, I know the people who have done, like Katie's got an amazing course on PR and that is now part of my Academy. I want one course per area of the music industry in this Academy. So people can stop wasting time looking for and wasting money on something that's not going to be right for them. Um, because there's a lot of free stuff out there. There's a lot of hacks out there and there are uh, a small number of people really providing great value. So that's how I created in the key of success. It's a few courses that I've created. It's the Academy. And I also have a monthly mastermind group called in the key elites that I started meeting daily when this whole pandemic started and we are in week 10 of meeting every weekday. And it's like a big fat love fest. I mean, people are cross promoting and doing Facebook lives together and growing and making money and getting out of bed in the morning because of this group. It's just, it's so magical. And I'm really, really grateful that people keep coming back and are finding some inspiration there. I'm glad you brought that up because we just had this conversation with another guest on the show out of England last week in that the whole game has changed now how we do business. Uh, we, we had a booking agent on the show a few weeks ago and I said, so where do you see yourself? you know, with your business and where things are going and, you know, well, we're kind of looking at the fall and literally we released that within five or 10 days. It was like, yeah, we're now looking at 2021 because things are changing so rapidly. Do you find that, I don't want to say lockdown, but we we're all at home. Yeah. Uh, we're all yeah, yeah. kind of, you know, we're not out there doing things. Do you find that it's easier, more difficult or different to communicate in the way that you've been doing that with these these weekly get togethers and and just talking to people? I mean, how how has it affected what you do, your business for good, bad or or, you know, indifferent? Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, like I'm still working from home in my studio. I've been in the studio for years. And for me, it's I've always responded to the world spinning a certain way. And now I'm still doing my stuff, but the world is not spinning that way anymore. So the response, what I'm doing in terms of responding is really, is really different for my community of musicians. For example, in, in the key elite, I, there are people that are quarantining at home and they are alone and they are not with bandmates and they are not teaching students and they're not doing all the things that they were doing where they were getting that personal interaction. So I think what I'm trying to provide is not just a Facebook group where you can comment when you want, but the real time you get feedback, you know, by someone's smile, by like, you can see the effect that 
that you're having on people in these Zoom calls. That, so it's, it's Zoom calls and everyone can talk at any time if you raise your little hand in the participation, you know, and, and it's, it's not just, I think a lot of people are like, oh, I'm in a community, I'm on a Facebook group. And I think that yes, Facebook groups are great for connecting and getting information and doing a lot of things. But I think that there is something missing that I'm, I think we're able to put in together as a community. So that's one thing that's changed is just being really more mindful about the fact that we've gone from all sorts of interaction whenever we want it down to no interaction and needing it. So that's the first The second thing that's changed for me is that I was working a lot with choirs literally the week before this all started. I was at a conference where one of my pieces got premiered and it was a I got a lot of inquiries about writing commissions. And I had spent my I cleared my March and April calendar to write choral commissions to get paid to write choirs, pieces of music. And all but one of those ended up being like, we're not going to we can't spend the money until we know what's happening. So that ended up being a little bit of a bummer. And now I'm looking at ways to sort of engage virtually. I've actually written a piece for a virtual choir so they can sing to each other, record their tracks. They send it back to me. I send it to them so they can experience singing along with their choir mates, not just to a MIDI track, you know, click track. So I've been experimenting on how I can get creative and support these other communities that I'm a part of as a, as a creator. But overall, I feel like I'm doing a lot of the same work. I'm just doing more of it and I'm needing to think more outside of the box. And honestly, to the booking agents that are like stressing out, I, like, I think there are so many brands that have Facebook pages that could host some awesome live concerts. Now that you're allowed to go on and, and host a live concert to anyone's page, Facebook has changed some stuff to make it really easy for, I think that those, those brands should be hiring these booking agents now. And I think there's a huge opportunity to make, I mean, people in my community that normally play for 30 people at bars and clubs are going on Facebook live and, you know, playing for thousands of people at a time because it, like people are sharing, it's so easy to get these audiences and there's ways to make it really creative. So I think if we're willing to shift, I think there's an opportunity here if we're, if we're open to it. We're going to take another break, get a, another word into one of our sponsors in the socially distanced studio, or maybe I should just finally say studios. We have our guest, Cheryl Engelhart, who's in upstate New York, and co-host Katie Long, who's in Mammoth Lakes, California. And you're listening to another edition of... This is Sasha from DLMDD in London. Thanks for joining me with host Bob Bender on the business side of music, my favourite music business podcast. You're listening to the business side of music. Wow, I just joined the Music Starts Here community. This is a truly hidden gem for anyone in the music business. Whether you live in Nashville or anywhere else in the world, Music Starts Here is like a GPS for your music career. This is the place to be if you want to get advice and direction from some seriously talented musical people who have been where you want to go. Music news, events, and a great big community with resources for artists, songwriters, musicians, studio and tech, along with music business advice from pros in the industry, all on one site. Make sure you get your free profile now. Go to www.musicstartshere.org. That's Music Starts Here. Org. You're listening to the business side of music. Back in multiple studios scattered all over the United States. Another edition of the business side of music. Co host Katie Long out of Mammoth Lakes, California is with us today. Katie, thank you so much. This is this is great. I always like to have someone that takes a little bit of that pressure off of me. <laughs> Glad to be here, Bob. Thank you very much. <laughs> and then Cheryl Engelhart out of upstate New York is with us. Thanks for being on the show. Oh my gosh, it's my pleasure. I'm so excited to be here. Well, Cheryl, I just have one more question about In the Key Elite, the group that you've created, the mastermind uh, that's been supporting so many independent artists during this whole pandemic that we are all going through on a global level. So can you tell us a little bit about who would be a good fit for this group and kind of how would they be able to join? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's, if you go to inthekey.co, slash elite that will take you to the page. There's a lot of information there. I think that this group is really sort of becoming optimized for musicians who are at a place where they're like, okay, I've done what I know to do. Like maybe I've done some Facebook lives. I've done, uh, maybe I have a record out or a couple singles. I'm at a place where I've done all the things I know what to do, but I'm not sure what's next. I love living in the space of what now. 
Um, I think it's a really empowering place. It's a really cool place for uh, creativity. It's a really great place to get clear on what do I need to learn or do I need to create something else like complementary content for whatever it is I'm created? Or am I in a place where I'm ready to to pitch? Have I done all the admin? Have I gotten my stuff in PRO? So if you're in any of the, those stages, or maybe you're ready to like monetize, like, okay, I've created all this stuff. I've gotten it out there. Like what are the next partnerships? What are the next, you know, communications that I need to go create? So anyone that's sort of looking to level up is, is who this group is for. I tend to, um, I have a bunch of other resources. I point to people if they're like, I think I want to do music. I don't think this is a group for people just starting out that are, are just constantly contemplating a career. I think it is for people to either have a career or thinking about a career. They have a job and they're transitioning or they have a part-time job. Or I I think there are a lot of people that um, teach music that are also growing their own music careers. So I think at any stage where you're like, I've done some stuff. I know that I'm in this game for the long haul, this music game. Now what? That that's uh, we, we live in that. That's our happy space. (laughs) That's so great though. Yeah. Because there's so much out there. And I know as a publicist, one of the number one questions I get, you know, is what do I need to do next? So having a mentor like yourself that can really give them a roadmap of the different angles, you know, whether it be PR, whether it be uh, securing partnerships like you did with Insight Timer and some of the meditation apps or email marketing. You know, it's just great to have an, a, a bigger picture for those artists of what they need to do to have success. Yeah. And there it's so it's like brainstorming and accountability all rolled in one. And they like people start to show up and see themselves as leaders and like they're getting to help each other and, and wait. And like now people are like holding each other accountable. Hey, you said you were going to like do that thing. Did you do it? And like I'm, I'm getting to like step back a little bit, not even step back. I'm actually getting to now do more coaching and dig in with people like it's getting it's getting personal but it's in like the best way possible like we're just knocking down our blocks left and right it's very inspiring it really like lights me up and I and I I think it's working because we're 10 weeks in and it's growing people aren't leaving <laughs> so 10 weeks in the daily we, the, the group has been around for a couple of years actually so yeah it's a really it's a beautiful place to be on the internet <laughs> very cool I like what you said it's really not for the starting musician it needs to be for someone from what I'm picking up, they really need to have their head screwed on straight and have some kind of an idea of what it is they're hoping to achieve and where to go and what they're looking for, right? Yeah, I think that that I mean, we do a lot of work with people whose heads are not screwed on straight. I have a very good head screwer on her. So you come to me, you're going to get your head screwed on. It's fine. And and it is open to anyone that is that wants to join. We have people that are not even musicians in the group that are just creative. We have a couple podcast hosts, a couple yoga instructors that are building studios and they get that the conversation is very music centric. So, I mean, if someone that's just starting out wants to come and get inspired, absolutely. We gear the conversation towards those musicians that are sort of looking to level up. And yes, I, I think that it is nice to have a little bit of a of focus. It helps. It helps the group. You know, a lot of people don't know what they want. And I think that it's easy in the music industry to see what the famous people are doing and think that that's what you want and not know that there's a lot of other options. So we sort of get to explore the spectrum of what's possible. And that's sort of how I live my my life is like, this is what's possible. I'm not super famous, but I'm very satisfied. I'm very fulfilled. I never get bored. And that's one of my shticks, right? Hello, I was scuba diving and I got bored scuba diving. That's why I got into music. So I'm able to to show what it looks like. And I think that that's what other people are doing for each other. And regarding cost, you know, I've had a lot of people like argue with me about what this costs because there are monthly masterminds and daily masterminds that are like in the thousands of dollars. But this has always been and will probably for a very long time remain $37 a month. So that's there. And there's some deals like if you pay for a year, all those things. And I might create some other tiers, but it is someone asked me today, like, why don't you just raise the price now that you're doing it every day? And I'm like, 37 is a really nice number. And I think that works for musicians. And they all know that they're getting a lot of my time and energy. And I am like completely ridiculously happy to do it. Sounds like a no brainer to me, honestly. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) I agree. And on top of that, it's, you know, we're in a time and a place where a lot of musicians are just out of work. I mean, we're in the heart of Music City, and if you drive down Lower Broadway right now, it's a ghost town. Yeah. 
the recording studios are a ghost town. There are so many artists and musicians out of work. And it's not just them. It's the touring players. It's the sound engineers. It's, you know, it's a full gamut of everybody. So $37 a month is actually very, very affordable. Thank you for having it at that price. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that and you're welcome. And I mean, it's someone said, oh, it's like a tank of gas. And how many of us are driving now <laughs> like that much? And I, I was like, oh, that's a very that's a very good point. So, yeah, if you want to spend your tank of gas on on a, a community, try it out. It's uh, in the key dot co slash elite. Yeah. What is that again? In the key dot co c o slash elite e l i t e. Definitely check that out, Cheryl. Thank you so much for being on the show. This has been great. I really appreciate you having me. Thank you so much, Katie, for for guest hosting, and uh, this has been a really great conversation. Thanks so much. The business side of music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow, and is produced by Bob Bender. The business side of music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Los Angeles, California, and Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Busan.
you still here? It's over. Go home. Go.